And Sam Rogers is in charge today, so they, if any children is not registered, you can do so out under the pavilion with him. Well, we just finished the Gospel of John, and so for the next few weeks, we're going to be covering a number of different topics in our message time. Next week, I'm going to give a State of the Church address. The following week, my brother will be here preaching uh, from Colorado Springs. Don't miss that. But today is the weekend of both the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. That's the Sunday closest to the Roe v. Wade decision. So today is the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. And it just so happens this year that it it falls on the same weekend as MLK. So I'm going to share a message entitled, Every Life, Every Color. And I'll be addressing the issue of both abortion as well as racial unity in Christ. And I'm going to give time for question and answer today, so be ready to uh, bring a question up. Uh, this, the message will be a little abbreviated, so we have plenty of time for that. First point today is this. God is the creator of all life, and life begins in the womb. The Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He said, it's good, it's good, it's good. Six day, He creates man and woman and says, it's very good. Man and woman are the height of God's created order, but all life is created by God, and it begins in the womb. Psalm 139, verse 13 says, You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Isn't that awesome? Jeremiah 1, verse 5, God says about Jeremiah the prophet, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now, science is now proving this point over and over again with advanced ultrasounds, showing the development of the baby with all the body parts there, the heart clearly beating at 21 days, the brain formed in the second month, fully formed. By the end of the third month, the baby is fully formed. It's just a matter of the organs maturing. Now they can even perform surgeries on the baby in the womb. Therefore, abortion is taking the life of an unborn human being. The reason the sin of abortion grieves the heart of God is because we are taking the very life that God created. The Ten Commandments say, Thou shalt not kill. And Jesus said to let all the children come unto Him. It doesn't matter if it's legal or not. Many things are legal that are sinful. The Supreme Court of the United States does not determine what is sin or what is right or wrong. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is the Supreme Court. His Word is what is ultimate truth and what we will each be held accountable to on the Judgment Day. Abortion's a modern holocaust. Since 1973, Roe v. Wade, 60 million children have been extinguished. Since 1980, worldwide, that statistic was in the U.S., 60 million. Worldwide, 1.5 billion have been killed. You can go to a website called numberofabortions.com and it will literally give you how many abortions have been performed since 1973 and it's constantly increasing. It's literally ticking an accurate figure. For example, 49,000 so far this year, and it's January. Is there forgiveness for the sin of abortion? Yes, and healing. We're going to be hearing later a testimony of a woman in this church that has experienced God's amazing love and grace and healing from four abortions. The argument for abortion is often made that the baby is better off if the parent doesn't want it or cannot care for it or feels they cannot afford it. But that's where adoption comes in. And many couples are waiting to adopt such a child, some in this very church. And the most loving thing to do is to have the baby and give it up for adoption. For the best definition of love I have ever heard is this one. Love is doing the highest good for another regardless of the cost to self. So the highest good for that child is to have it go to parents that can raise it if you can't. And this is so gospel-centered because salvation in Jesus is called an adoption. We're adopted by God, being that we were originally born into sin and Satan's dominion, but God came to rescue us 
and adopt us into His family through faith in Jesus Christ. And there are believers from this church who go to the abortion clinic in Gwinnett County to pray for those who are about to enter. They go every Tuesday and they try to approach in a loving, balancing truth and grace. And one of the things that they will say to those women who are about to enter is we know of three, and it's probably going to increase to four after today, we know of four couples that will adopt your baby right now if you will not bring an end to that life. Furthermore, we also see how God can bring great good out of an unplanned pregnancy that in the flesh could have resulted in an abortion like Mary, an unwed teen who is pregnant with the Son of God. Or Sarah, an old woman who got pregnant and would have been at a high risk for a dangerous birth, gave birth to Isaac. And God called himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now let's take this truth and maybe expand it a little bit. Point number two. God loves diversity. And he is sovereign over all ethnicities. God loves variety. Look at how different each one of us are. No one looks exactly the same. No one has the same DNA. No one has the same fingerprint. Even identical twins are not ultimately identical. And we see this amazing aspect of him loving diversity in the fact that the amazing diversity in the number of species of animals and plants and stars and all of his created order. Look at these slides. Look at the diversity of species in the animal kingdom and all of God's creation. Look at this. It's amazing that God loves variety. By the way, there are 339 breeds of dogs and only 43 breeds of cats. (laughs) Now that just shows, does it not, that God loves dogs more than cats. (laughs) By the way, have you ever heard of the theology of dogs and cats? The dog says, you are God. The cat says, I am God. (laughs) 10,000 species of animals are discovered every year. 2,000 new plant species are discovered every year. Now either we discover things that were already there, Or, God's creating new species of animals, and we're discovering. I don't know which it is, but I do know that He loves variety and diversity. Job chapter 12. But ask the beast, and they will teach you. The birds of the heavens, and they will tell you. Or the bushes of the earth, and they will teach you. And the fish of the sea will declare to you, Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? Psalm 104, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. I told y'all a few weeks ago how much I love the outdoors and I love to have my quiet time with God in the morning out on my front porch. And my dad, who's here today, gives me a hard time because it's like if it's 40 degrees or, or warmer, I'm out there at 5.30 or 6 in the morning. And I love to be out there when it's dark and then the light begins to gradually come. And I love to be out there when, when it's completely quiet and then all of a sudden the birds start chirping and they get louder and louder. And a, a little devotional that I love is called Inspired Evidence, Only One Reality. And every day of the year, it's a reading about something involving creation. And the, one of the readings that is one of my favorites gives the story of George Washington Carver. He patiently analyzed the peanut and brought it down into compounds. He then began to put these compounds back together in various combinations until he had produced more than 300 different products from the peanut, ranging from soap to shampoo, meat sauces to milk substitutes, and of course, peanut butter and peanut oil. What is most interesting is how Dr. Carver began each day. He rose at 4 a.m. and took a walk. During those morning walks, he prayed for guidance and help for the day's work. When success came, he gave God the glory. He once said, quote, without God to draw aside the curtain, 
I would be helpless. Isn't that awesome? If it weren't God drawing aside the curtain and allowing me a little into the knowledge that he has, I would be helpless. He called his laboratory God's little workshop. And then it talks in here about the, the trunk of an elephant has 10, I'm sorry, has 100,000 muscles. The trunk of an elephant, 100,000 different muscles. God is creator of all. God loves diversity. And God is sovereign over all ethnicities. For he loves diversity so much that in his highest created order, that of you and me and humans, he wanted there to be various ethnicities. And that's recorded in Acts chapter 17. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. Amen? He himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man, Adam, God made every nation of men. And that's where we get ethnicities. That they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Hallelujah. My mother used to say, if two people were just alike, one would not be necessary. And who wants to be unnecessary? <laughs> the Bible says that man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, I, I see no man according to the flesh. What does that mean? It didn't mean that he didn't notice if someone was of a different ethnicity, but he would choose not to ultimately see them this way. He ultimately chose to see their heart, their spirit, that they were created in the image of God. And the fact that they were created in the image of God meant that he could appreciate the differences and not prejudge someone based on external things. Now, I was raised in the South in the 60s and 70s when race relations were not so good. There were still segregated schools. We lived in Alabama, South Carolina, and Georgia during my childhood. And I was fortunate to be raised in a family where racial differences were respected. My dad was involved with civil rights causes. My mom taught in an all-black high school for the purpose of modeling racial reconciliation and seeking to live out the gospel. And all of this despite the fact that my distant family owned slaves years ago. For when we were clearing out some of my grandmother's possessions after she died, we found a receipt from 1834 for the purchase of a slave. A receipt for $650 that purchased one Negro slave. The reason the sin of racism grieves the heart of God is because all men are created equal. And we are all created in His image. And God created the various ethnicities and He wants us to value this diversity and not judge someone based on the color of their skin, but rather look at their heart. The essence of racism is twofold. It's not seeing all people is being created by God, and it's pride in thinking that one is better or superior to another based strictly on something they had no control over, the color of their skin. My mother told me once that her dad said to her, Melba, how's that for a southern name? Never forget that you had nothing to do with the fact that you were born white. Another element of this is when we make assumptions about an individual or prejudge them based on their ethnicity, such as all blacks are blank, all whites are blank, all Hispanics are blank, all Asians are blank. Now this final point, and then we'll have some Q&A, is the most important, and it really brings it all together. Number three, the gospel of Jesus Christ provides true unity of all ethnicities, and forgiveness of all sin. Beloved, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ accomplishes much. We saw this in our study of John. 
Jesus is the Word became flesh, the bread of life, the way, the truth, and the life, the resurrection and the life, the good shepherd, the vine, the great I am, and on and on. Jesus is all-powerful, and He healed the sick. He gave sight to the blind. He brought hearing to the deaf, and He raised the dead to life. He provides forgiveness of sins, healing, reconciliation between not only us and God, but us and others. It's very important. He breaks down the sin, he breaks down the barrier of sin as it relates to the vertical, us and God. And he breaks down the barrier of sin as it relates to the horizontal, because if a person is in Christ, They're my brother or sister with the same father in the same eternal home. So ultimately, Robert is not ultimately a Ugandan. He's my brother in Christ. Enoch is not ultimately a African-American. He's my brother in Christ. Enoch, or I'm sorry, Ed, is not ultimately an African-American. He's my brother in Christ. Enoch is not ultimately a Hispanic. He's my brother in Christ. So this is very important. I believe this this is a supernaturally, providentially why a cross is both horizontal and vertical. (laughs) because he breaks down the barrier between us and God. Anything that could divide me and God, my sin, my inability to be perfect, my my pride, my my everything that would, my going my own way, anything that separates me between me and God, Jesus died for, Jesus paid for, the blood of Christ can forgive and remove so I can have reconciliation on this level. But it doesn't stop there. There's also reconciliation on the horizontal. It reconciles me and others because I, if I'm in Christ, I see others different. I see them as being loved by God. I see them as being created by God. I see that Jesus died for all people. I not just look at the outward. I look to the heart and anybody in Christ. We are in the same family, and we're going to spend eternity together. Now, the verse that really addresses this is Ephesians chapter 2. And by the way, the context of Ephesians 2 is the relationship between Jew and Gentile. And in the first century, many Jews felt superior to others because they're a part of the chosen race. And so there was this great divide between not only Jew and Gentile, but between Jew and Samaritans. They were a half-breed. This is why the interaction between Jesus and John 4 and the woman of Samaria is so significant. Boy, if you want to hear a powerful sermon on John 4, listen to Tony Evans' message unpacking John 4 and Jesus' interaction with the woman of Samaria. So the, the background of Ephesians 2 and the context of Ephesians 2 is the relationship between Jew and Gentile. And he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you once who were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. He himself is our peace, who has made the two, Jew and Gentile, one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Boy, aren't there walls of hostility between different different ethnicities, then and now, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandment and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, peace with us and God, peace with us and others. And in this one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both, Jew and Gentile, have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Now listen closely because there's another point here that's very important. This forgiveness and the power of the gospel applies to both the one sinning and the one being sinned against. Listen closely. It applies to the one sinning. If I'm a sinner and I'm committing something that violates God's holy standard, there can be forgiveness for that sin through the cross. At the same time, if I'm the one being sinned against, I've been the recipient of of mistreatment or racism. I cannot harbor unforgiveness and bitterness and hate in my heart. The gospel doesn't allow me to do that. So the cross is relevant for the one sinning and the one sinned against. So if you're guilty of the sin of abortion, guilty of the sin of racism, you must confess that, you must repent of that, and go to the cross with that. If you've been the recipient of the sin of racism, you've been the victim, 
You can't remain in victim mentality. The gospel won't allow you. You must forgive, and you must love just as the one who has committed the sin of racism. The gospel sets us free on all levels, beloved. And God loves diversity so much that He promised heaven will be filled with diversity for all of eternity. You see, God created all, and He values diversity so much. He wants that diversity with Him in heaven forever and ever and ever. Check this promise out, Revelation 7, 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. And the more we can experience this on earth, the more we can experience unity in Jesus despite diversity of the flesh. And that diversity, not just ethnicities, age, gender, backgrounds, socioeconomic status. The more we can experience unity in Jesus amidst the diversity of the flesh, I believe the more glory it brings to God because only He can accomplish that. And it shows that our focus is on Him. And it's, a part, it's part of bringing thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So, we've seen today that God is creator. Creator of all and life begins in the womb. We've seen that He loves diversity. And He's sovereign over all ethnicities. And we've seen that the gospel of Jesus brings unity despite the diversity and provides forgiveness of all sin. And now I want you to hear from someone who's experienced God's forgiveness from the sin of abortion. Rachel? Pastor David, by the way, that 60 billion, that calculator doesn't count. Chemical, that's just the surgical. There's much more. Hello, church. Good morning, forever family. My name's Rachel Sims. <laughs> so Jesus saved me in 2001. As I grew to know Christ and the truth of his word, I also came to know the truth about my abortions. In high school, I had two abortions and two abortions when I was an adult. In high school, oh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get a little trouble seeing. I wrote this down so I could get this all right, what the Lord put on my heart. So. Understanding the reality and healing from the regret of these abortions has been a process and a journey. My involvement with the church, pro-life causes, also was part of this journey. I've spoken at conferences and in churches about the regret and pain of abortions. I've worked in a uh, maternity home and also helped many people decide not to have abortions. I have um, I had one young black man come to me and ask me about getting his girlfriend an abortion. I told him, you don't know if your child might be the next Martin Luther King Jr. He did not go through with that abortion. Even though I knew I was forgiven, there was still a shame and a pain and regret deep inside my soul. I still felt less than others. Hearing how many online and the church spoke about those who had abortions was not always easy. I still felt the scarlet letter A of abortion stamped on me. Many in the church did try to help me understand that Christ's death was also for the sin of abortion. I humbly asked the Lord to forgive me, and I believe he did. I went to prayer ministry during a difficult season of my life. They didn't just pray for me or give me advice and speak truth but they sought to encounter the Holy Spirit with me. 
During the sessions, the Lord showed me how a lot of my life's issues stem from the abortions and all the fear and wrong beliefs that had led me to have the abortion. He showed me the truth about all of it. The Holy Spirit walked me through the memories of the abortions and showed me compassion like a good father that he is. He held me as I mourned their loss. Jesus touched some tough places of my heart towards forgiving everyone, including their dads, the clinics, my parents, and friends. I acknowledged my part and placed the blame rightly on myself and on Satan. No, no matter how many times I heard or read about forgiveness or told myself and others I was forgiven, I still needed to receive healing from him. I remember the doctors, the pain, and saw how my heart was hardened through the trauma of abortion and the rage it created in me. By Jesus' one-time sacrifice, poured out blood, I'm forgiven of all sin and cleansed from all unrighteousness. During these encounters, I believe he removed the bitterness and all the pain. I believe he let me know I'm not disqualified from all his promises, his blessings, and all he created me to do. He helped me to fully receive his forgiveness and believe the cleansing from all unrighteousness. I deserved hell, but he showed me mercy. His healing power set me free from the pain of the abortions. His spirit was more than willing to restore me and strengthen me to share this now and with anyone else he leads me. He wants to free everyone from the pain and regret of abortion and every sin. He is a kind and compassionate father that can and will do this for anyone who comes to him. He values every life, every color. Colossians 1, 13 through 14 says, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transformed us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption for the forgiveness of sins. In 1 John 1, 7 and 9, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rachel. What an example of Jesus came to set the captives free. Amen. Rachel's involved in a ministry here called prayer ministry. And uh, if any of you can avail yourself of it, if a guy comes, well, she'll make sure there's a a male present with her, but it's just a chance for you to go to the house of prayer and set up an appointment, and uh, it can be 30 minutes or an hour, where uh, they will pray specifically for some area that you want prayer for, it can be breakthrough, it can be greater freedom, um, but it's a powerful ministry, and Rachel is being mightily used to the Lord to touch the lives of many. I want to quickly give you three practical things to do with today's message, and then we're going to open it up for some questions. Number one, ask God to give you his heart, whether it's in the area of abortion, whether it's in the area of racial unity, ask God to give you his heart. We need his heart. We need his perspective. We need to have the heart of the Father given to us. I am convinced that many of us and our passivity toward abortion is very similar to the Christians in Germany at the time of the Holocaust. That you know what the Christians would do when the trains would go by their churches? 
full of Jews being sent to the concentration camps, they would sing louder so as not to hear the train. And I wonder if we do the same today. We do not want to face the reality of what's happening. So we need God to give us His heart in both the area of abortion and racism. Number two, reach out to others with the love of Christ. Reach out to others with the love of Christ. This may be those who've had an abortion. And I think it's very important when we talk about the sin of abortion. And I appreciate Rachel mentioning the fathers of the children. If you have impregnated a woman and encouraged her to have an abortion, that is a sin before Almighty God. And so we need to reach out to those with the love of Christ, whether it has to do with abortion or racism. One of the ways to reach out to others is to be intentional about developing relationships with those of different ethnicities. It will provide a great education and a great understanding of what it's like to be in their shoes. Number three, take a stand against sin with truth and grace. Take a stand against sin, whether it's the sin of abortion or the sin of racism or any sin for that matter. We take a stand with the combination of both truth and grace. If it's all truth, no grace, it'll be harsh, it'll be judgmental, it probably won't be done in balance. If it's all grace, no truth, then you'll compromise truth. Truth and grace are so important. And I believe MLK modeled this in his nonviolent approach to injustice. Had he been violent in his approach, and this was one of the questions in first service, was about how to take a stand without being guilty of sin yourself. And violence is a huge one. Many will speak out or do things with a passion regarding racism, but they'll be violent themselves. Same with abortion. We don't bomb clinics. We don't kill doctors. It's a balance, and there must be truth and grace. All right, well, I would imagine that this message has surfaced some questions, so here's the way we're going to do it today. There'll be two microphones. Raise your hand. A microphone will be brought to you, but we're also providing a way for you to text a question, and then that will be sorted through and brought to my attention. So you can do one of two ways. You can text a question to that number, or you can raise your hand and a microphone will be brought to you. We had some great questions in first service. Charlie here, and if if somebody like this right now, we're bringing the mic to Charlie, go ahead and um, raise your hand if you want to be next so we can kind of be really efficient with our time. Charlie? Hi. So uh, there was a BBC interview um, some years back, of course, before I was born with Muhammad Ali. And Muhammad Ali talking about racism and race relations, he brought up the point, or in his point, he said that he was not for things such as uh, interracial marriage, but he claimed to not have anything against any other races with uh, ideas such as saying that, you know, you look at nature and bluebirds fly with bluebirds and redbirds fly with redbirds and you don't see them mixing together, according to him. And so what are your thoughts on that and how do you address um, that when it's brought up through other people in conversation? So what, what, what do I believe about interracial marriage? Well, interracial marriage and then also the idea that races don't have, like people of other races and ethnicities do not have to interact with each other because there's this argument that people who look alike are attracted to each other and tend to communicate with one each other almost exclusively. In the flesh, that is what we naturally tend toward. But we're not to be driven by the flesh. We're to be driven by the Spirit. And God wants it brought together in a beautiful, harmonious way, under the headship of Jesus Christ. And uh, I believe in approaching something like interracial marriage, it's very important to approach it from a theological perspective. So let me me, um, back up a little bit to provide a foundation. Marriage is to be an earthly picture of what? Christ and the church, right? Jesus is married to a church composed of every tribe, nation, tongue, and people, right? So I would argue that an interracial marriage could actually glorify God in a magnificent way because it may provide even a better picture. I'm not saying it glorifies God more, 
than a same ethnicity marriage because what really glorifies God is love in that marriage <laughs> and doing things his way. But I would argue theologically that anybody who's opposed to interracial marriage has to analyze it theologically. And I believe it can, it can be, if it's a godly couple, be a great picture of Christ and his church. Of course, they're going to have different challenges because of the variety. We've got several in this church. Um, but I think it's an amazing picture of Christ and the church personally. How would you address abortion when the lives of both the mother and the child are in danger should the pregnancy continue? Yeah, I think um, if the life of the mother is in danger, it's truly in danger. I think that argument is sometimes used maybe flippantly, but um, that's, that's each individual's call, um, whether or not it's, you know, if the life of the mother is truly in danger, do you take the life of the child? Um, obviously, that has to be done very prayerfully. And, um, but, I, but we know that that's the very, very rare case. Rachel, what's the stats on that? Do you know? It's highly unusual. Even the rape and incest is, is a very small percentage if you look at that statistic on the website, um, which it gives the constant count. Um, do you want to say something on that, Stephanie? Hold on, let me, let's bring you the mic because I want to make sure that those listening online um, can hear what you're saying. I have a friend who is in that situation. Some medical issues came up during her pregnancy, and the doctors told her that her and the baby's life were both in danger, and they strongly recommended that she terminate the pregnancy and she said I will absolutely not do that mm. my God is bigger than that and she and that baby are s totally fine now mm. so doctors don't know they have no right to say that that's right good word and that's why I really hesitated answering I don't think there's a, it's easy to say well yeah if the life of the mother is in danger then of course it's okay and and that's why I, I don't know that I'm comfortable giving an answer that flippantly it has to be done with much prayer and there's a great testimony of God working a miracle yes so, um, for at least in my experience, I've noticed there's a lot of uh, lingering attitudes of racism coming from the older generation, which is not something um, I hold against. Hold the mic a little closer. I'm having a hard time hearing. Okay. Um, so the uh, so I've noticed there's a there's some lingering attitudes of racism from the older generation that seems to be communicated down through. Um, millennials and, and a lot of and, and younger people now, and I'm curious um, as a, as Christ followers how we are to address the kind of lingering attitudes um, with kind of the balance of the new ideas coming through about um, uh, race races blending and um, being multicultural. Does that make sense? Ask it another way. I'm, I'm not sure I'm really um, following your question. Uh, what I'm asking is, how do we address older, older attitudes um, towards racism now as, um, as God is kind of healing that, um, as, as God has been healing that throughout time? And I don't know if this addresses what you're saying, but I think it's, in, first of all, I think it's important that even if we are not personally guilty of a sin, you know, I hear the argument all the time by Caucasians, you know, I, I never owned slaves, so don't hold me accountable for that, the sin of slavery. Okay, that may be true in one sense, but I think if we're going to truly love, in the definition I gave, highest good for another regardless of the cost of self, it is very important for the majority culture, Caucasians, I believe, to seek to identify with the history that certain races have been through. For example, the Jews and what they experienced during the Holocaust, African Americans during the history of slavery in our country, that the most loving thing to do is to identify with that heritage so as to have greater understanding and compassion. At the same time, constantly being ready to search, for God to search my own heart because I think the issue of racism can be so, there can be the hidden sins. David talked about, expose to me, Lord, the hidden sins of my heart. Those things, those areas that I'm blinded to. 
where I maybe do have a tendency to stereotype a certain group. And um, so I don't know if that addresses what you're asking, but those are a few thoughts. Yep. This is Carol, way in the back, way back here. Um, I just wanted to address the comments um, that the young man in the front row made. I don't know his name, I'm sorry. Um, but Muhammad Ali was Muslim, bottom line. And scientifically, bluebirds and blackbirds are different species. Black, black and white humans are still the same species. So I just wanted to bring that in a scientific point of view. That's good, that's good. Over here and right here. I just like to say everyone is, is talking on different language, but I like to talk as someone who went through racism when you couldn't drink from the same fountain, when you couldn't walk on the sidewalk. If you saw a white person on this side, you had to go on that side of the street. How you couldn't have the freedom to do things that you wanted to do because you were black and not, not putting it off on all the white people, how the Ku Klux Klan would burn crosses in front of the black school and tell them that they had to get out, how they were coming to the homes and the bosses of those people, not just those people, but the farmers that was working for those white people, how they would get in with a group and come to somebody's house, take them out in the woods and kill them and, and set fire to them and things like that. But what I learned is going through that and seeing those things as I got older, that I couldn't hold that against the people because I knew that God would be the one that, have to, um, that they would have to answer to. So I'm so glad today that I can look at people of different colors and see that their blood is red. It might not have the same DNA, but it is red blood. And that blood came through Jesus Christ because he's the one that created us. Yeah. And the only one that could, that for that blood. So I'm thankful that I can walk today, laugh and talk, mm. hug white people, and not think nothing different about what mm. they did to my race or what they did to my family. Because mm. as we go on, we think about it, and true, it hurts, but you're still a child of God, and God created you, and whatever happens, he has the answer for all things. Amen, Leola. Good word. Wow. Wow. So this is a great example of how, you know, if, if you were to sit down with someone like Leola, and you say, tell me your story. Tell me what you've experienced. Uh, I was recently with Kevin Daniel, pastor of Bethel Baptist in Watkinsville. It's an African-American church, and uh, it's over 150 years old. And he was telling me there are people in his church that still remember the KKK marching downtown Watkinsville. And, you know, I want to I sit down with some of those people, hear their story. And when you hear somebody who's seen it and tasted it firsthand but can share with such freedom a gospel perspective, that just blesses me and encourages me in the same way that Rachel, having been through what she's been through, but can share the healing and the forgiveness she's experienced. It is powerful, you guys. You know, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. testimony. See? I had a comment to Robert's you know, question in that today that right now it sounds like in the room we're talking racism is black-white. But those of us that went through 9-11 and didn't cringe when we saw someone who looked like they were you know, someone from the Middle East yeah. had to examine our own hearts yeah. and do that. And I also wanted to comment to the thing of interracial marriage. I am a product of an interracial Amen. marriage. I am a proud half-breed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but you know, going through that, I had an understanding because I was neither black nor white. You know, and having to go through that and understand from different sides. And I remember the first black student that was in my classroom in elementary school who wondered why you know, he was so much different and he was a little bit darker than I was. He became one of my best friends mm. because we were different. Mm. You know? So I appreciate the differences. And it's only in the last couple of years that I fully appreciated 
my parents getting married because it has made so much of who I am, wow. and especially in my missional context wow. of just understanding people in a totally different way. So the answer to Romer's question is just examine your heart. There are things that God is going to reveal and say, you are racist in some form or fashion, uh, and be healed of that, but also accept the diversity of who you are. And be led by the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit direct you in terms of the cleansing of your heart, maybe new relational connections you would make, intentionality. Go ahead, Jimmy. Uh, I am a black woman, and I find it hard to keep forgiving white people when they continue to hurt me. How do I continue to forgive them? Is it, uh, is it godly to avoid white people to protect myself? May I answer that? Yes. How many of you today have been hurt sometime this week? The rest of you are lying. <laughs> no. All of us, as a way of life, have to live in forgiveness. Forgiveness is not a one-time thing. It is a lifestyle. And we're all hurt regularly. Uh, and the reason we have to forgive continually is that we are continually being forgiven. Amen. So that hurt is not uh, different from other hurts. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to because we've been forgiven, and we have to because God demands it. Good word, brother. Well, in Matthew 18 is the perfect passage for that where the disciples asked Jesus, how many times do I forgive? Seven? He said 70 times seven, and then he told the story of the person who had been forgiven much, and then they turned around and didn't forgive the person who sinned against them. So the key to forgiving others is realizing how much we've been forgiven by God. And uh, in answer to that part about do I avoid white people, no. You avoid white people because of this, you're just pushing the issue under the rug. Um, there needs to be the forgiveness in your heart. And this is where prayer ministry may come in, right, Rachel? You know, if a person says, I just can't seem to get over this. This is a stronghold in my life. I've tried everything, listened to five sermons that still hadn't done it. That's where prayer ministry really comes in because that will, if it's led by the Holy Spirit and your heart's humble and open, you're going to see breakthrough in that prayer session. And God may surface some things that really goes to the root. Michael? Hey, do you mind if I address the rape and incest and life of the mother sure. thing on abortion? Yeah, because right. Michael's very involved in pro-life causes. Yeah, I'm with uh, Georgia Right to Life. And, our, and with the rape and incest... Uh, when a woman is raped, that's a terrible crime against the woman, and she is the innocent victim of the crime, okay? But if she becomes pregnant, the baby is also an innocent victim of that crime. And we believe that life begins at conception, therefore we're against abortion in the case of rape and incest. Matter of fact, the statistics show that women who are raped get abortions at a lower rate than women who just have regular pregnancies. Okay? And then the life of the mother is very complicated sometimes, but all we ask is that people start looking at the, the mother and the unborn child both as patients, okay? Mm -hmm. So let's say a woman is, has cancer, then um, she has a right to choose treatment for that cancer that may damage her child or even kill her child. She has that right as a medical decision, but we don't believe she should have the right to abort the child, mm -hmm. okay, so that she will have a better chance at her medical medical treatment. That's all we're saying. So treat them both as patients. Um, a lot of women do take cancer treatments and the baby survives and they sur survive and she has the right to do that. But just treat them both as patients. Good word, brother. Thank you. And thanks for your involvement with Right to Life. Right here and then actually we'll go to Ann and then over here. Go ahead, Ann. This is just a comment on racism. As a young woman, I was influenced by racism, but in the church, we began to have people of a different race to come in, and I, and I, and other people, people of my race started leaving, and something in my spirit told me it was wrong. And then I'll always be grateful to a lady who said to me, "If anyone comes in here and sits down beside me, they're either my brother or sister in Christ, or I want them to be." Mm. And that helped me through life. That helped me to come to grips and treat people like Jesus well, would. Good. But then. I am fascinated now with something that Marsha Wilbur introduced us to in a class not too long ago, and that is in the science of epigenetics. They are believing that 
living close to the Lord, having a close relationship with him, and taking in the life of Jesus actually changes our DNA. Mm. <laughs> and then I don't know if you remember, but I had a word for the church not too back some time ago. But the last sentence was, Jesus' DNA makes us one. Mm. And I don't know, that's just changed that's my good. whole thinking Amen. about everything. Thanks, Anna. So that other statement, I love that. It's the person sitting next to me is either my brother or sister in Christ, or I want them to be. <laughs> that's good. Um, I'm really nervous to say this, but I feel like the Lord put it on my heart. So um, it's kind of what she was just saying, but uh, a friend recently like told me this, and it was really convicting. Um, she said a lot of times we see more in common with like another Georgia fan or like someone of our same race than we do of like another follower of Jesus. Mm. And I was like, whoa, that's pretty crazy. Um, that someone from another country or someone of a different ethnicity who is also a believer we would find less in common with um, than like someone else who loves the dogs. And I was like, that's pretty crazy. Um, because when we have Jesus in common, like that is our identity. And that is just everything that we live for. So um, I hope that encourages you. Good word, good word. And that's eternal. The other's not. Uh, hey, I just, I had a question. I knew somebody once who, um, got pregnant, but then there was an issue with the pregnancy and the baby would have essentially been a stillborn. The baby was not developing. And so, and she was at risk of, of dying. And so my question isn't about that particularly, but when she mentioned it to somebody in the church, they told her that it would be better that she die and the baby die because there wasn't, the baby wasn't going to be born. They told her it was better that she die than that she get an abortion. And I just, I, I wonder if you could speak to that, um, so they said, the church's response. They said that the one, say that one more time. So the woman had to terminate the pregnancy because the baby wasn't going to make it, and if she continued, she also would die. And somebody in the church told her it would be better that she die than that she terminate the pregnancy. Yeah, I think that's, that's an inappropriately judgmental. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You know, it's, it's sad sometimes, is it not, the things that believers say that damage people. Uh, Rachel, you alluded to that, that at first it really, it, it delayed, is this a good way to put it? It delayed your healing because of the, some of the condemning statements that were made, even by Christians. To you, or that you had mentioned, or that you saw online, or that you, in some of the, and this is again why it's so important, truth and grace. Truth and grace is Jesus came full of truth and grace. And y'all have heard me say this, but the, the way he handled the woman caught in adultery is the perfect model of truth and grace. He said, neither do I condemn you, grace, go and sin no more, truth. And uh, one without the other is not healthy. Um, I just kind of wanted to speak. Hold the mic close, please. Sorry, you shouldn't have to tell you me You really that, should right? know this because you're one of our worship leaders, Christy. <laughs> well, Christy. This is when I get nervous. Um, I just want to speak to a couple of different things, and I'll try to be quick. I'm not good at that either. Um, I think to your talking about the multi-generational, I think that it's just as important not to be racist, but also to be anti-racist. So when we see things and we hear things, to be silent in that like Trev talked about, is cooperating in that. So yeah. we have to speak up. We have to speak out, but do so with truth and grace. We don't have to be ugly. We don't have to be disrespectful. And By the way, on, the, on that note, you've got to, you guys got to read letters from, letters from a Birmingham jail by MLK. Yeah. Because he's addressing clergy of his day saying, look, just wait, you know, just give this more time. Mm -hmm. And he says, you Christians who are doing nothing yeah. are actually, a, you're, you're a greater, you're causing more damage to the cause of equality and justice. Right. You're causing greater damage than the KKK. Yes. So I've had to do that with my own race. A lot of times it comes from a place of fear. It comes from a place of um, ignorance and not knowing. 
and um, sometimes people's actions, they don't even realize that they're being racist in certain ways. So I think that as a community of people that it is very important that we speak up, we speak out, we're, we're not ashamed, we don't hide, and to just still do that with a level of truth and grace. Um, and, and this goes across the lines with abortion, racism, abuse, um, seeing people differently in whatever that is, whether it be um, race, socioeconomic status. Um, if any of you have heard my testimony, I come from a life of trauma and um, just kind of putting it into that perspective, a white man molested me, a black man trafficked me, a biracial man beat me and cheated on me. So that shows you that it's not the color of somebody's skin, it's the posture of their heart and it's the sin of their heart. So should I hate all men because men hurt me? No, I should love them through the power of the Holy Spirit. I should forgive them through the power of the Holy Spirit and I should teach others to do the same because he has given me the strength to do that. And so if we just sit idly by and never stand up and never speak out, then we are just as complacent as those who are actively doing it. Wow, good work, Christy. All right, worship team, come on up. I'm going to have to cut it off. Here's how we're going to do our response today. It's going to be a little different, but um, we're going to, as we sing a song or two, we're going to, have, we'll have our normal prayer teams available at the sides and the back if you need personal prayer. But I'm also going to kind of open up the altar here for individual and corporate confession. Obviously, if, if God is convicting you of sin, you need to repent. You need to bring it to the cross and receive forgiveness. At the same time, there's sometimes when we need to confess the sins of our nation. And that's very biblical. There are times when the Israelites were called to, we have sinned against you. And it might not have been their own individual sin, but I believe it does something in the spiritual arena. It un unleashes the Spirit of God to bring healing and change and revival. You know, in that verse, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, and confess their sin, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. And so it does something in the spiritual arena, I think, to bring about the, the greater activity of God's presence. And so even though I may not have personally been in any way guilty of the sin of abortion, I can say, God, forgive us. Forgive our nation. Forgive the passivity of the church or whatever. Um, I can confess that on, on, on the part of, of, of a corporate nature or the nation, and I believe God blesses that. So we're going we're gonna to do that today. Um, individual confession, repentance, corporate confession, repentance, intercession for our nation, for us as individuals, for our church. Maybe it's just a way of saying, God, I want to be greater salt and light in these two areas. Show me maybe something that you would have me do in this area of abortion and racism. So, God, we thank you for your truth today. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the cross and the power of the gospel. We thank you for setting the captives free. And, Lord, now as we seek your face in confession and repentance and prayer, we pray that you would forgive us, Lord. You would show your mercy. That you would fill us with your spirit to be the salt and light that you've called us to be. That you would bring a revival in this church, in our hearts, in our community, and even in our nation and world for your glory. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together. The altar's open. <laughs>